Coming up on Market to Market. Inclement weather hits the country as harvest season nears the end. Keystone XL is dead, but another pipeline rises from the ashes. And rural America nurtures a larger crop of renewable energy. Those stories and market analysis with Brian Roach, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, November 13 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Retailers had hoped consumers would open their pocketbooks a little wider, but the reality fell short of expectations. According to the Commerce Department this week, retail sales rose one-tenth of a percent last month after being unchanged in both August and September. When sales of automobiles are taken out of the equation, retail sales rose two-tenths of a percent. The Labor Department reported the producer price index fell four-tenths of a percent last month, and core PPI, when volatile food and energy purchases are dropped, fell three-tenths of a percent. The dismal news for producers put a drag on Wall Street, as the Dow Jones Industrial Average finished the week more than 600 points lower. Some of that drag can also be attributed to lower oil prices. Last week's rejection of TransCanada's Keystone XL pipeline had no effect on plans for the Dakota Access Pipeline. This week, 12 days of hearings kicked off in the Midwest as more than 270 witnesses spoke their minds. Testimony focused on potential pipeline breaks, objections to eminent domain, and the number of jobs lost if the project goes the way of Keystone XL. Elsewhere in the region, as the hearings got rolling, some producers were rushing to bring in this year's bounty. However, the weather was not as cooperative as it could have been for those with a few rows left in the field. Mother Nature started to draw the curtain on the 2015 harvest season as inclement weather hit the Midwest, mountains, and high plains, affecting more than 36 million people. High winds and heavy rain swept across the Midwest, whipping up tornadoes in Nebraska and Iowa this week. We kind of stuck our heads out the back door and seen it coming from the south going straight north and kind of watched it go over the interstate. Midwesterners were treated to hail and a light dusting of snow as part of the fallout from a weather system that stretched west to the Rocky and Sierra Nevada mountains. Wet, heavy snow across the Great Plains earlier in the week knocked out power to hundreds and triggered school closings. Further west, a weather system moving across California brought cool, wet conditions to low-lying areas. The welcome moisture will not end the state's four-year drought, but forecasters still expect a strong El Nino to bring above-average precipitation to some parts of the state. And for some out west, the snow was a welcome change from recent warmer weather conditions. Oh man, I'm stoked. Yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been a long time coming, but it's good to see it's here. You know, they were talking about it being a big year and it didn't quite hit. You know, it's been kind of a slow start to the season and now it's just boom, it's awesome. Next month, United Nations Climate Summit will focus on cutting greenhouse gas emissions. According to the World Bank, climate change could push more than 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030, as weather conditions disrupt farmers' efforts to grow crops. Despite the gloomy outlook, there are those in rural America who are working to lower their carbon footprints. Producer John Torpy explains. Reducing reliance on foreign oil and cutting greenhouse gases has largely been associated with city life. However, there are those in rural America who share the same concerns as their urban counterparts about the planet's health. Beyond reduce, reuse, and recycle are efforts to bring renewable power into play 
and chart a new way forward for energy security and a lower carbon footprint. Nestled in a cornfield near Kelowna, Iowa, are four and a half acres of solar panels soaking up the sun's rays, collecting energy for homes and businesses across the landscape. This 2,900 panel array took three years to build and is the crowning achievement for Farmers Electric Cooperative, one of the nation's smallest groups providing power to rural customers. The fact that this solar program is being carried out by a rural cooperative means a lot because we need big companies to do their thing. We need small companies to do their thing, but we also need cooperatives to do their thing. The solar farm makes 1,800 watts of electricity available to each of its 600 members and the pool of 800 kilowatts produced by the array is helping the cooperative reach its goal of guaranteeing 15% of each customer's electrical power needs will come from renewable sources by the year 2025. One of the groups helping Farmers Electric, and countless others, is a coalition that shares the same long-term goals. The 25 by 25 Alliance is made up of a broad spectrum of green energy supporters who, through advocacy and engagement, are working to make 25% of the nation's energy come from renewable sources by the year 2025. The partnership is employing an all-of-the-above strategy to achieve its energy goals while benefiting the community. And what we end up with is an opportunity for these new distributed generation projects like this solar farm here in Kelowna being economic engines across rural America that are producing dollars for the local economy and they're delivering cleaner forms of energy that the world is looking for. In the town of Linden, Indiana, the state's first solar array was built for the members of the Titmont Electric Cooperative. Much smaller in size than the Kelowna solar farm, the array produces 100 kilowatts, providing enough power for nearly 20 homes. The array is being called a community solar farm because power distribution is handled much the same as a community supported agriculture group, or CSA, operates. Members lease a panel from the cooperative's electric CSA instead of erecting panels on their own property guaranteeing a portion of the energy they use will be renewable. Getting solar out to those members who you know, may not be able to have solar on their, on their premise, whether it's because of trees or their, their building isn't structurally sound or they have you know, uh, covenants in their neighborhood where they can't install them. Um, so this gives them an opportunity to do that. Many projects like these were started with Rural Energy for America program grants using funds earmarked in the 2002 Farm Bill. The seed money has helped farmers and rural businesses make going green more practical and affordable. In Danville, Indiana, Wabash Valley Power took advantage of their not-for-profit status to secure clean renewable energy bonds to construct a methane capturing facility at a local landfill. The green power plant provides electricity to 2,000 homes in the area and takes advantage of a greenhouse gas that would otherwise be vented into the atmosphere. So as time went on, we, we saw the opportunity to take that same methane and put in these engines to make electricity rather than just flaring it off into the atmosphere. Capturing methane at landfills for power generation is a practice that has been in use for several decades. In Runnels, Iowa, a partnership between Metro Waste Authority and Houston, Texas-based waste management helps provide electricity to more than 11,000 homes. The Metro Methane Recovery Facility has been in continuous operation since 1993. Due to increased demand, the partnership opened a second capture station in February of 2014. The landfill is permitted to collect methane from the decaying municipal waste until the year 2048. But officials say there will be plenty of fuel well beyond the expiration date on the paperwork. As we know, once the garbage is put into the landfill, it continues to break down and continues to make methane. And so as far as how long it will continue to generate methane after that point, we're not quite sure at this. But as garbage continues to break down, there's always methane available to recover and turn into electricity. 
capturing gases escaping from municipal solid waste facilities is only one method of producing power from methane. The dairy cattle population near Fair Oaks, Indiana is close to 60,000 head. Searching to find a better way to dispose of the manure, producers in the region built anaerobic digesters to turn a waste product into power. This closed loop system utilizes nearly all of its organic feedstock in one way or another. The heart of the system holds 6.2 million gallons of manure. The waste product is cooked at 105 degrees for 25 days to prepare it for other uses. Methane captured from the process is burned by nearby generators to produce electricity for use in the homes of cooperative members, as well as power the daily operations of the dairy. And even the excess heat from the generator's exhaust is used to keep the digester hot and the system in constant running order. The captured solids become animal bedding and the liquids become pathogen-free fertilizer that is sprayed onto nearby fields that grow feed for the dairy herds. In addition, the digestion process virtually eliminates odors from the area, which is one of the goals of Steve Boss, owner of Windy Ridge Dairy. Because of, because of the, the amount of cows that we put in this area and the spreading of manure, doing the digester really removed about 90% of the smell associated with the manure. And so that really went a long ways neighborly-wise. And as the U.S. looks towards a future of reducing its carbon footprint and decreasing reliance on foreign energy sources, the search will continue for low-impact, innovative, and cost-effective methods of electricity generation. And as the price per kilowatt hour comes down, rural America will be among those powering up with green sources of energy. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. Farmer storing grain, a bearish WASD report, and private 2016 acreage estimates hammered the grain markets. For the week, December wheat lost 28 cents, and the nearby corn contract lost 15 cents. Prices in foreign markets and on-farm storage pushed the January soybean contract 12 cents lower. December meal fell in step, dropping $6.90 per ton. In the softs, December cotton gained two cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, December class three milk futures lost 45 cents. The livestock sector had a volatile week as the market swung from limit to limit as the December cattle contract lost four and a quarter. January feeders dropped 748 and the December lean hog contract declined 20 cents. In the currency markets, the US dollar index gained more than two tenths of a percent. December crude threatened to fall below $40, losing $3.55 per barrel as supplies continue to climb. COMEX gold declined by $6.90 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell nearly 19 points to settle at $3.33.60. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Brian Roach. Brian, welcome back. Hi, Mike. Let's talk about this wheat market. Exports have been a challenge in this market with the strong U.S. dollar. We had export news out Friday morning. How did wheat fare? Uh, middle of the road. I mean, the real, the headwind in, in the wheat market, as we all know, is there's really two pieces to that. One is world stocks are, are at 20-year highs. Uh, we, and, and then the dollars, uh, a, a big headwind for wheat prices to U.S. exporters. So that probably won't change here near term. And, you know, I think that actually we need to see a, the dollar or the interest rates tick up here in this next Fed meeting, get that out of the way. Maybe we see a, a break in the dollar that, that gives a, a tailwind to U.S. exporters. But for now, I think guys who are in a situation with wheat in the bin, they're going to have to wait until we see how Russian wheat comes out of dormancy. The rally we saw in Chicago wheat that uh, just a couple weeks here yep, ago had, wheat, weeks ago. had yep. wheat up over 52025 uh, in that neighborhood was really based on a, a dry weather problem going into winter for Russia. We know that normally isn't what makes that crop over there. We've got to look at spring and summer weather, and that's still obviously ahead of us. And hopefully, 
there will be some selling opportunities in there at some point, especially if we can get that dollar to step back a little bit. I think a break in the dollar would be it would be a tailwind that we haven't had for quite a while. All right. Well, let's jump down and look at this corn market. Uh, we had the uh, USDA uh, World Agriculture Supply and Demand reports. The WASD reports come out. Big surprise for the corn market in this report. Tell us a little bit about what happened. Well, the, the USDA saw, and I and we agree with their numbers on corn yields being you know moved up 1.3 bushels. If you look at the western states, that the question was, would the western states really perform? And our numbers and our yield watch that we that we obtained from our customers was pointing that way. You know, I was a little nervous of how big they were, but uh, I, I would tend to agree with the USDA numbers, particularly. In, in Iowa, Minnesota, 10 bushels over the record. Nebraska, big big over their record. South Dakota, 10 bushels over their record. So I think the corn and also the bean yields are there. Now, was there anything in that report that you didn't agree nearly as much on as we look at the corn markets? Well, I think you have to look over at corn demand, particularly in the ethanol market, uh, taking 75 million bushels out of ethanol when gasoline demand is three, five, six percent higher than last year and the three-year run rates, I just don't know. I think that's just too pessimistic for me. Uh, uh, knocking down exports, I understand that, I think, but it's still, it's, it, we're very early in this crop year. I think there's a lot to, to play out here. Uh, I would probably draw some question to that, but um, over on the bean side, I, I, they did come back and increase bean exports. They took them out last month, brought them right back this month. I think bean exports will continue to perform. I think bean crush will continue to perform. Uh, but there's some other world factors that are at play here. Okay, well, let's come back and talk about this corn market. We've had a lot of farmers. The talk has been store the corn, sell the beans. General uh, advice to farmers uh, throughout this harvest season. Are we going to get a good selling opportunity before the first of the year in this corn market? Do you think we're going to get back to close to four? I'm not sure I see that. Uh, I think that the, the, the dollar is too big of a headwind for now. Uh, we could see some rallies here, but right now we're at the low end of the technicals for corn. They've actually held up okay this week in the face of the dollar actually rising to the top side. Uh, I'm not so sure I see futures prices making that big of a move. The real play right now is in basis. The spreads are doing the work. Basis is that, you know, we, Roach Ag, uh, we work with a, a sell signal that focuses on the futures market. I think really the sell signal today is in basis. And if, if growers have cash flow needs, uh, the reality is that we, we think that growers need to get cash flow buckled down so they can carry themselves into the spring where best prices are typically found. So the play might be, if you're, if you're accustomed to it, is to, is to sell those strong basis no, cash numbers today and come back and buy something, a futures contract into July or a call option into July and make sure you retain that ownership. So that for the, for the growers that are comfortable with that, that might be something to look at. And for growers out there considering that, that model, would you, do you have a preference, straight futures or call? Well, the, the problem with the options is that there's no volatility there. And if a grower's wanting to really treat it like it's corn in the bin or mm -hmm. beans in the bin, he's better off buying the futures okay. at prices here that are at you know, multi-year lows. I think it would still be the best play to buy the futures contract. Okay. Well, now let's jump down and talk about the soybeans. Uh, you mentioned in the WASD report they upped the export numbers. And we've got a question here from one of our followers on uh, Facebook. Tim in Crookston, Minnesota is wondering, as we look at exports, will China gobble up more beans? I think so. Uh, this report uh, uh, showed China's import number up uh, 1.5 million tons. I think that'll continue to grow. So the U.S. portion of that's 80, 80 million tons. That could be 83, 84 million tons, I think, before it's over. Uh, so the demand side for world soybeans is strong. Uh, the question is, is who's going to get their piece of it in terms of supplying it? And I think for now, we're, we're, you know, we're a good story, uh, but we've got other concerns. Argentina sitting on a couple years' worth of beans, some elections that are promising price cuts. Uh, but I think the answer to the, to the grower's question is, I think that bean uh, demand will outperform. It always does. Uh, and so you have to wait for the best opportunities here. On the production side, did you find the USDA in line with kind of where you guys were envisioning this harvest season? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the, the yield numbers, we, we were seeing real strong yield numbers and our kind of 
uh, under the cover corn number was real close to the USDA's, our official numbers on our on our website for our customers, mm -hmm. which is a bushel below where they ended up. But I, I, we, we, we definitely saw those yields. You know, we're saw, seeing Nebraska numbers come in very strong over last year's when we look at our comparisons. Same with Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, all very strong numbers. And so I have no reason to think that both the corn and the bean yields won't be there. Okay. I don't know that I see a lot of upside okay. in corn yields from here into January. The real worry would be is that bean yields actually drift a little higher. And that would be the question for producers who didn't sell beans right off the combine, stuck them in storage. How do you play this market that just can't seem to find some solid ground? Very much the same way as corn. Okay. Processors are, are bids are up 20 cents. If you look at the basis levels by state, they're all drifting higher here because the grower right now is getting ready to finish up harvest. Uh, there are still some combines mm -hmm. running. And so once I think that, that, that the, the doors are shut, then you'll see another spike in basis, and that might be the play, very similar to corn. Okay. Now I want to talk to you briefly about the cotton market. We saw some stability this week. Is that going to continue? I think the downward trend in cotton uh, remains. Okay. So I think it's still, uh, from a technical standpoint, it's a sell. Uh, you know, we're in the 62 range here, 65. There's a pretty long-term long, long -term resistance up at, at the 200-day moving mm -hmm. average there. I think it uh, continues to be a sell market. And if you come up against those longer-term moving averages, it's a, it's a sell uh, market still. Okay. Uh, nothing changed there. Gotcha. Now let's jump down into the livestock market. And this past week, to trade cattle in particular, you almost had to be wearing a crash helmet. Talk to us a little bit about what's going on in this live cattle market? Limit up, limit down. Where are we going next week? Well, the professional money is really what's driving a lot of the, the volatility, I think, and paying less attention to the fundamentals and more attention to, you know, where, where the opportunities are and, and what the trends are in prices. Uh, I thought uh, before today that this double bottom that we had maybe were forming was, would, would be good, but then today's trade action looks more like, more like a kind of a bear flag. So I think that uh, if we can hold this 132, 130 level here, this probably, uh, opt that's pro maybe some optimism in there, but I, but I don't know that uh, the funds are gonna look at it any differently when you start to look at inventories out into next year. I think there's still probably more opportunity, more value in the downside than there might be in the upside right now. Should a producer still be using the futures markets to hedge on the live or feeder cattle markets? Well, I, I think so. I think you just have to be careful and wait patiently and wait for w weeks like this week. We're really not a week to be doing anything unless you took some short uh, profits off, some short hedge profits off. And then the, the attitude ought to be is the seasonals. Right now we're running counter to seasonals. Mm -hmm. And so you really ought to be looking for some opportunity on the upper side of the range. And, but you're just going to have to wait and be awfully patient. Upper side of the range, where would you peg that? Uh, 138, 140 at the most. Okay. And I think cash probably trades on into winter, uh, say low side 125, high side 135, 138. So I think that's probably the, the market for a while here. All right. Well, now let's jump down to the feeder cattle market off almost seven and a half bucks on the week. Took out the lows we'd set first week of October. Are, have we opened the door to the downside here in feeder cattle? Yeah, very much the same as the lives. Uh, if you look at the charts, they're, they're similar, although not as, as volatile. I think the, the feeder cattle is well supplied. Uh, pricing is tough to get, uh, pricing has been real tough to get your, your hands on uh, decently priced feeders. I think for now it's, it's a downward trend. Okay. Where do you see that downward trend ending and what kind of timeline would you put on it? Well, if you if you trip this next level here, I which mean, would be pretty close to it today. Yeah, to, uh, right. So right here where we closed today, I didn't see the closes on the feeders uh, today. Close but, today uh, at one sixty four fifty five. Yeah, that opens up a, a downward uh, leg down to say the one forty fives, one fifties at least initially. Okay. All right. So, how does a guy hedge that market? You what you really need to do is just wait, sit tight and wait for opportunities with up uh, towards the upper side of the range in those markets and uh, and be patient and look for how to add add that hedge profit to your animals. And at this point, I think that's really what you're gonna have to do because the professional money is really running this separately from the fundamentals and that's a big challenge. Now, you mentioned upper side of the range in feeder cattle. If on Friday we took out that low and we begin the downside, would that 165 become the upper 
bound on that range? Yeah, maybe 166, 167. Okay, all right. Well, then let's jump over into the hog market. Uh, several tough weeks in a row for hogs, only down 20 cents this week. Are we finding a bottom? We might be. Uh, the funds have been big sellers here for the last three weeks. They've been, uh, you know, the programmatic trading has really driven these hog markets down, but it's also, I think maybe we're running the, at to the end of the seasonals here. Uh, cutouts were up a buck 34, buck 35 yesterday. I didn't see where they finished today, but at least there's been some up, upside here to cut out values. And so I think, uh, you know, you, you, we could be finding a bottom here, although the, the bottom still could be open. Uh, we just put in contract lows, and you know, from a, from a trader standpoint, you, you typically don't buy contract lows. And so uh, you might want to be real patient with that and look for some confirmation of bullish uh, play on the fundamental side, cutout values, et cetera. Okay. But I do think that the supplies are probably uh, waning at this point, and that does offer some upside uh, here into spring. Now, with all of the volatility in the livestock markets over the past month, for producers who are worried about longer-term hedging, we're talking first quarter of next year, second quarter of next year, do you still sit tight and hang out, let this sort itself out to find some opportunity? Or do you grab some of these profits in cattle that might be slipping away? Well, I think that the, if, if you're working with somebody on futures, there's, there's stop limits to protect profits. You have to use trailing stops to ensure that you don't let things get away. Okay. Uh, waiting for better opportunities is, is sometimes a losing battle. Okay. All right. Well, Brian, I really want to thank you for taking the time to join us this week. Thanks, Mike. It was a, an interesting week in the markets. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Brian and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in the Market Plus segment available on our website. It's the place you'll find audio podcasts and streaming video of the program. You can also interact with us through our Twitter and Facebook feeds. You can find us at Market to Market. And join us again next time when we'll examine one farmer's quest to revive an Old West icon. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.